Now for today's program. Craig Nelson is a historian known for writing about epic moments in the American experience. His writing has appeared in Vanity Fair, The Wall Street Journal, Soldier of Fortune, National Geographic, and a host of other publications. He is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Rocket Man, The Epic Story of the First Men on the Moon, and he was a Penn Award finalist for The Age of Radiance, The Epic Rise and Dramatic Fall of the Atomic Era. His World War II histories include the first heroes, as well as Pearl Harbor, From Infamy to Greatness. Craig's latest book is V is for Victory, Franklin Roosevelt's American Revolution and the Triumph of World War II. Joining Craig today is Moment contributor Dan Raviv. Dan was a CBS correspondent in Israel, Europe, and Washington for 40 years, and then senior DC correspondent for Israel's I-24 News. Dan is the author of books about Israeli espionage and diplomacy, including Spies Against Armageddon and Every Spy of Prince. Please welcome Craig Nelson and Dan Raviv. Thanks so much, Suzanne. Craig Nelson, it is great to have you in this uh, Moment Magazine Zoominar, where we'll talk about your book mostly, V is for Victory, Franklin Roosevelt's American Revolution and the Triumph of World War II. But Craig, be warned, I think we're going to talk about mostly Jewish angles because most subscribers to Moment, um, well, frankly, are American Jews and interested in those subjects. You okay with that? I'm honored to be here, and I'm honored to discuss that, absolutely. Well, it is, of course, part of the story of World War II. Your focus is, I would say, America waking up. You describe America, oh, especially when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was first inaugurated as president in March of 1933, as being uh, poor, asleep, uh, dejected, uh, still in the depression, uh, the economic depression. And of course, that's what society was like, too. And over the more than 12 years that FDR was president, um, well, like you say, the country woke up, defeated the depression, managed to win World War II. So first, defend, if you will, a statement you make early in your book. If any one human being is responsible for winning World War II, it is FDR. Because you also credit the American public much more generally, but you are a big admirer of Roosevelt. Well, I like to say that Roosevelt is the greatest politician in American history, and I mean that in all senses of the word. You can easily see people who did not like him because he was powerful enough to be able to steamroll his way through anything. And if people were in his path, he rode right over them. For example, he did really did not like firing people. So he would just hire someone else to do the same job as you until you got upset and quit. So, so I have many flaws with Roosevelt. However, uh, he did raise the American public who in 1933 when he took office had been defeated in turn by the Great War or World War I, the Spanish flu and the Great Depression. We were a really sort of pathetic bunch of people. We were beaten down in a very weak state very hopeless and very despairing and he used the power of his bully pulpit to rise this group of people up and make them the, be the ones who defeated the greatest evil in human history. Well, is that because he recognized that Adolf Hitler and, and uh, an aggressive Germany were a danger to America's future and what it is that America wanted to accomplish in the world? He was able to read many languages, including German, and he read Mein Kampf in the original German, and he became outraged at how much of the crazier stuff was taken out in the English translation. So that was his first. And, and then he started reading the cables, such as one Nazi philosopher suggesting it would be a good idea to put a Jew's head on top of every telephone pole on the 500 miles from Berlin to the North Sea. So he really thought that they were a crazy terrifying bunch. And in 1938, when England and France tried appeasing Hitler with a piece of Czechoslovakia, he turned against that program and he initiated a very small program to dramatically boost warplane production in the United States. And that became the secret of the arsenal of democracy, which was the weapon that won World War II. The arsenal of democracy, as you put it, and that's waking up American industry and making trucks and making airplanes uh, and getting workers motivated. But, but indeed, there's a, there's a spirit behind it, as you point out, and I suppose he saw Hitler's regime as the diametrical opposite. Now, now, for viewers who need a reminder, the United States did not enter the war until December of 1941. December 7th is when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, of course, a U.S. base. Uh, and so the U.S. entered the war against Japan and its ally, 
Germany. Uh, but Roosevelt was prepared to do that. And I'm thinking even of his famous Four Freedoms speech, it's in your book, of course, uh, in January of that year, 1941, when he said that, the, as I read it, at least that the United States stood for four freedoms, the freedom of speech, the freedom of worship, the freedom from want, and the freedom from fear, as in the only fear, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Um, so again, speaking of freedoms, if that was Part of how FDR was trying to motivate this country, as I say, Germany was the opposite, right? He knew we would go to war at some point. Well, this, the, the, the absolutely crucial years for all this was 38 to 1940. When France fell in 1940, that's when the American people woke up and realized something had to be done. Uh, and that's when they started turning around from being isolationists. But before then, we really needed a period of getting ready and no one wanted to do it. So Roosevelt would do these secret things uh, uh, within the political system and he would convince the government to go along with it and he would keep making them bigger and bigger and bigger. And the way he was able to do it was by using what I call the one Sith, many sheaves approach where he would say, this program is going to help our defense and we're gonna sell this stuff to foreigners and they're gonna give us money and it's gonna help our economy and it's gonna give our employees something to do so it'll help unemployment. So this entire arsenal of democracy he was actually using it to boost the, the economy. And so everyone said, well, if we can make money, we're all in. Uh, but, but also uh, he was using it to keep American men from going to fight overseas and, and sending planes and tanks instead. So he was using, oh. by having this thing that would appeal to so many people with all these things they could do, he was able to push forth uh, isolationist America out of that. Well, in this book, V is for Victory, and your previous writings too, uh, you portray an America that did not want to get involved, as you said, isolationist. And there's one hero of the isolationists, Charles Lindbergh, Lucky Lindy, uh, 1927, for being the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic, was a hero in the 1930s, uh, made a fortune, of course, giving speeches and, and, and increasingly political, and he wanted to keep the U.S out of the war, it was pretty obvious he was an anti-Semite uh, in a speech uh, also in 1941. Uh, in fact, ironically, on 9-11 in 1941, uh, Lindbergh in Des Moines, Iowa, gave a speech in which he said Jews and the British wanted to get us involved in that war and we shouldn't. And uh, apparently Lindbergh was so strident. What would you say? He, he kind of played it too far. Suddenly, Lindy was not popular. Well, Lindbergh is an amazing story because uh, for many years, he was pretty much the most admired American in the world. And he was probably the most famous American besides Roosevelt in the world. But what happened was his child was kidnapped and murdered and he blamed American society for this. So he exiled his family to England where they fell in with the wrong sort of hoity-toity Brits who said, Hitler's gonna defeat everybody, just get on the bandwagon, don't fight this. And he, through them, he was able to take a tour of the Luftwaffe and the Nazis fooled him. They did a thing and the Soviets did this in the Cold War too, where they had the same planes circling around and around to make you think there are lots of planes when it was just the same ones going by. So uh, even though he didn't have any real reason to believe this, uh, Lindbergh started publicly saying that uh, Hitler's going to win. It's foolish for America to even think of fighting him. Just give up and go home. And he started publicly doing this. And he and Roosevelt got into what was called the Great Debate, where they would each make lectures and speeches on the radio. And Americans could follow along and watch the development of foreign policy as it regarded the war in Europe. But Lindbergh was even crazier than we know. After Roosevelt won his third term, uh, Lindbergh said, democracy is over in America. The only thing, the right thing to do is to take away voting rights for black people. And if the Jews think things are bad in Germany, wait till they see what might happen to them here. So he was even much worse than we publicly knew until recently. Now, again, keeping in mind for Americans who forget, the only person ever elected president four times, the only one ever elected more than twice, now we have term limits, was FDR, was Roosevelt in 1932, 36, 40, and 44, just to you know, place it all in, in context. Now, did I, did I get it right from your book, though, that Lindbergh's speech and his America First Committee that might remind some of our viewers as to things going on in U.S. politics now. But Lindbergh, the isolationist, 
did he go too far in that speech and other things? Or you'd say basically FDR won the debate in their radio speeches and editorials. Well, so while Lindbergh is making these harsh anti-Semitic comments, uh, Roosevelt is talking about how if your next door neighbor's house is on fire and you have a nice garden hose, wouldn't the right thing to do be to lend him that garden hose? So while Roosevelt is elevating the American public into doing the right and good thing, Lindbergh is playing on crass hatreds and doing the good thing one. Here's another isolationist. Joseph Kennedy, whose son JFK would become president years later. Joseph Kennedy, uh, you report in 1940, told Hollywood executives, don't make anti-Nazi movies. And there was a Jewish angle in his remarks. Yes, uh, there is many people have this theory that if the Jews did anything against the Nazis, it would be uh, they would it would spur anti-Semitism in the United States. And even though this wasn't never turned out to be true, people kept using that excuse over and over again. So Hollywood was a particular target of this, and they would in fact be investigated by a Senate committee of isolationists to find out who was making such movies as the great dictator. But that committee would fail, and part of it would happen when Roosevelt said, you know, I believe the Bible was written by foreign born and Jewish people to sort of undercut their argument. So would you say Roosevelt in that period that we're talking about, arguing against Lindbergh, arguing against that congressional committee, was Roosevelt a, a pro-Semite, a philo-Semite? Uh, what, what label can we put on him in, in this regard? Oh, absolutely. His was, he had the most Jews in his uh, cabinet and in his uh, administration of anybody. The Secretary of Treasury was Jewish. Uh, Felix Frankfurter was on the Supreme Court. A major economic advisor was Bernard Baruch. And in fact, people would use that against him and claim that he was secretly a Jew, that his real name was Rosenbaum, and that the Jews were going to take over the United States. And, and uh, 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 so the fact that he had so many Jewish associates was held against him many times. So we have a period in the U.S. of rampant anti-Semitism. Again, viewers, think about what's going on in the U.S. lately that you might be concerned about. But back then, a period of rampant anti-Semitism. And one of the big issues was the claim by anti-Semites that American Jews wanted to get us involved in the war. Uh, is that right? I mean, that came up in a lot of broadcasts by anti-Semites like uh, Father Coughlin on the radio. Uh, th that was a theme of theirs. Jews want to send us to war. Yes, they, they tried to make it seem as if the only reason to going to war was to save the lives of European Jews. And did we want to sacrifice American boys to save European Jews? And they kept bringing that up over and over again. And, but they were also insisting that all we had to do was defend the Western Hemisphere. We didn't need to go overseas. Well, by the time the threat was apparent with the fall of France, we didn't have enough of an army to defend the Western Hemisphere, much less go overseas. Well, uh, another another incident of huge public anti-Semitism, uh, and of course it's in your book, was in February 1939, Madison Square Garden in New York, the German-American Bund held a rally, uh, 20,000 Americans, Americans of German extraction generally, many with Nazi flags and paramilitary uniforms. Was that an incident that again was going too far, so they lost support? Not really. Uh, at that time, you had a situation, I mean, here, that Boone rally was in New York City, which is so inconceivable today, but also there was a, a huge German-American influence in the Midwest, such as the Chicago Board of Censors would censor anything that might be remotely attributed as anti-Nazi. They even put through a film that the Nazis produced saying that they had to invade Poland because the Poles were such vicious people they were going to attack at any minute and they had to invade them to defend themselves. So there was a sense of anti-Semitism going on all this time and it was quite lurid and public. A, uh, a, a preacher was at a meeting at the State Department and he said, you know, I think the good Lord drowned the round bunch in the Red Sea for the Ten Commandments. And it's just horrible public statements like this. But at the same time, a major issue that people get confused about in this history is immigration. And just like now that there's a bunch of fervent anti-immigration group going on, then there was a real fervent anti-immigration group because they thought it might protect them from the Great Depression to keep out everybody. 
So a lot of the issues that people now think of as being anti-Semitic were really just completely keeping the rest of the world out entirely so that there were limits on how many Germans could come in and how many Austrians and how many Bulgarians or Poles. And this gets tied in with the, when the German Jews and Austrian Jews start fleeing for their lives. Well, an example, of course, is the ship, the St. Louis, that headed toward America in 1939. 900 Jewish refugees were on board and it was turned away. And some of those passengers even cabled telegrams to the White House, trying to get the hero, Roosevelt's attention. Um, apparently he just turned to his officials who said, there's a limit, there's a quota. Congress passed a quota. We can't let them in. And those people, as, as we know, about at least 250 of them uh, died in the Nazi horrors after the ship went back to Europe. So what's your take on that? Roosevelt just turning away a ship that was such a visible issue right there in a near an American harbor. So the this was in 1939 and in fact coincided with the visit of the Queen and King of England for the first visit in America of the Royals and the beginnings of Nathan's famous hot dogs, which the Roosevelt served the King and Queen of England. But at the same time as that is happening, the, um, the ship St. Louis is bound for Cuba. In fact, it's not really bound for the United States. And at Cuba is where all of them are supposed to receive their entries to the US. But everything gets fouled up with the Cubans having anti-Semitic protests. And they aren't let in because the United States has these ironclad anti-immigration laws. And there's already a huge number of Germans and Austrians in line ahead of the people on the St. Louis. So what should have been an act of charity becomes this huge political hot potato where if Roosevelt is seen as looking like he's helping these people, the, the rest of the country is going to make even more extreme anti-immigration laws and make it even harder for people to come in. So for example, after the Anschluss, uh, uh, Roosevelt announces that all of the Austrian Jews who are already in the United States can stay. They don't have to worry about being kicked out and people attack him for that. And he said, I don't have it in my heart to kick, me, kick them out. So that, that's an even more extreme story than the St. Louis to me. Of course, considering the, the Anschluss meant that Germany just uh, absorbed Austria and it became a Nazi country. So you're pointing out some place where Roosevelt was a little softer than the regulations might require. And yet that incident, the St. Louis, that ship is still brought up 84 years later, sometimes by very active American Jews who on the one hand know that Roosevelt, well, everything you wrote about, uh, ended the depression, led the United States through a successful war, inspired Americans. And yet again, if you will, from a Jewish angle, they point to the St. Louis, they point to another subject that I know we'll also discuss, um, a failure to bomb the Nazi death camps, Auschwitz, or even the railway lines heading to Auschwitz. I don't know if that decision ever came to Roosevelt's desk. Anyway, feel free to answer both of those together, because again, in the year 2023, where we are right now, I still hear those criticisms of Roosevelt, American Jews who say he was really great, but. Well, one of my favorite research topics in this book is the question of the bombing of Auschwitz. And this story begins with the Czechoslovakian government in exile sending message to the White House saying you really should bomb Auschwitz. And the Jewish World Congress replying, no, don't bomb Auschwitz. They were worried that the doing so would give ammunition to uh, the Nazis saying, oh, look, the, the allies are killing Jews, too, because definitely more Jews would be killed in the bombing of Auschwitz. And the second question was, well, even if it was bombed, where would the Jews who, who escaped go? There was no way for them to get out. They were surrounded by Poland. They were surrounded by Nazi-held Europe from all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. They were in Poland. There was really no place for them to go. And the same story happened with Churchill investigating the bombing of the rail lines to Auschwitz. So if they were, even if they were successfully bombed, it would still be killing many Jews overhead with the bombs. And by knocking out the railways, they could only affect maybe three days of people going to the camps. The Nazis had become very good at, under the threat of Allied carpet bombing, rebuilding things at a tremendous rate, and they would have gotten those rail lines back up in three days. So that was the argument, which played out intercontinentally. But the underlying issue to all that, <clears throat> excuse me, is that the Nazis held all of the continent of Europe. The death camps were in the middle of Europe. 
the only way to really do anything for the Jews during the Shoah was to invade the Nazis as we did at Normandy in 1944. Before uh, that, there was really nothing we could really do. Ah, you believe the US and its allies were doing the most important thing, invading Nazi-held Europe and defeating Hitler and ending the war as quickly as they could. That's what you're giving Roosevelt and and, and at least the Western allies credit for. That, I also I, I hear think, yeah, I also think Roosevelt did as well as he humanly could under the political situation of the time, where even Stephen Weiss, who was pretty much the leading Jewish activist in the United States, disagreed with many things, such as using Alaska as a territory for Jews or bombing Auschwitz. And he very literally explained quite a bit of these issues in his many writings. And you mentioned in your thanks to your very thorough research in V for Victory, you mentioned uh, ideas within the U.S. government to maybe make the U.S. Virgin Islands a haven for Jewish refugees, or as you say, maybe Alaska, which wasn't yet a state, uh, to, be, to be used in that way. And uh, those ideas got shot down, partially because you describe internal debates. Well, you said at the Treasury Department, the secretary was Jewish, Henry Morgenthau Jr. Um, and, and you make very clear the State Department at the time Again, our viewers will sometimes think the State Department lately, but the State Department at the time was clearly anti-Semitic, and you just say so with, with quotes from senior state officials. There was an incredible situation at state where the guy who oversaw the Jews getting visas to come to the United States went out of his way to keep them from getting visas. In fact, his biographer called him the American Eichmann, and his name was Breck Long, and he got away with this for many years until the Treasury Secretary, Morgenthau, did an investigation and sent it to Roosevelt, accusing the U.S. government of being in concert with Shoah. So that woke up Roosevelt. He established the War Refugee Board. They saved about 200,000 through primarily Raoul Wallenberg, but that didn't happen until very late in the war. Well, okay, I, I hear you. And by the way, the uh, the title of that document that the Treasury staff under Morgenthau put together is amazing. The title of this government document, Report to the Secretary on the Acquiescence of This Government in the Murder of the Jews. And it accused the State Department of doing so. By the way, since you mentioned so much Treasury and State, um, the uh, rapidly growing Department of War, later Department of Defense, uh, did you get a feeling about their attitude toward Europe's Jews? Uh, I actually don't know that they had much of an attitude. The, the story with the War Department is that in 1933, in the 1930s, uh, we were fort, our military was 14th in size in the world. We were between Portugal and Bulgaria. Uh, we couldn't afford to let people practice bombing with actual bombs. They used bags of flour instead. Those were known as Betty Crocker bombs. And if you were training to be in a tank, uh, you, we'd only produced 33 tanks by the 1930s. So to train in a tank, you marched down the road with your four other people in your tank and pretended to be in a tank. And then the really lucky ones got to use least good humor ice cream trucks and to pretend to be in tanks. So we were really an ox cart that needed to be a jet plane to defeat Hitler. And so the entire army and Navy and Air Corps were focused on purely military issues and sort of fighting over the economics of what the civilians would get and what the military would get. Okay, so neither you nor your cat who's on the sofa behind you uh, <laughs> has a belief that, that the War Department was actively anti-Semitic or going to Europe in order to save Europe's Jews. No, no, they were going out there to defeat Hitler and fascism as our commander-in-chief Roosevelt told them to do while there was a Pacific War raging and that's why it was called the Second World War. And, and by the way, sometimes people also forget where we were when, when Roosevelt was sworn in in 1933 with the Depression still underway. The First World War had, had only been had ended 15 years before that. People, there were lots of people who remembered that war and, oh, we have to go into it again. I mean, no wonder the reluctance, uh, right? I mean, that, that would be part of the mild isolationism World War I didn't settle much for the U.S. There was regret that we were involved in right. World War I? Right. So you have World War I ending 1919, immediately followed by the Spanish flu, which is killing off tens of millions of people, immediately followed by the Great Depression. So to me, Americans were in this completely defeated, beaten down state 
in the 1930s when all this starts happening. One of my most uh, heartbreaking stories in that period is a little girl's at school and she bursts into tears. And the teacher says, what is it, honey? What's wrong? And the little girl says, I'm so hungry. I can't even listen to what you're saying. I just can just think about food all the time. And the teacher says, it's okay, honey, you can go home and eat. And the little girl says, I can't, it's my sister's turn to eat. What a poor so, country. You know, imagine Americans living like that. And that was very common of children being dropped off at orphanages because their parents couldn't take care of them. And these were the people who were going to defeat Hitler. It's a story you couldn't make up. Well, as we've mentioned, Craig Nelson, um, it, was, uh, it was the attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese that drew the U.S. formally into the war. So December 1941. And so the notion of of saving Europe's Jews, you know, being maybe one of the goals, at least felt by some Americans and certainly by American Jews when they heard what was happening to their brethren, but they weren't hearing a whole lot. Um, in your book, you, you say a key moment was, was, was newspaper reports, you know, coming out of Europe and the New York Times quoted one in just five paragraphs November 1942, the U.S. was already in the war, and it mentioned, the New York Times did, Hebrew language newspapers were reporting on the systematic killing of Jews. In other words, any place that the Nazis had taken over, they were finding the Jews, locking them up, killing them. Um, and this was about Poland the first time, and then the Times noted that the State Department had confirmed that the Nazis murdered about half of the Jews in every territory they conquered, and that would mean two million, just unthinkable, two million Jews murdered. So tell me, because a lot of this is in your book, that even Jewish organizations, even Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, when getting a briefing on this, couldn't believe it. Well, if you think about it, the depth of the Shoah was so tremendous, it does define human comprehension. So that although the Americans were well informed about it by 42, primarily through Edward R. Murrow, who was a great radio star of the time and who reported from London and who had a hugely successful show. Uh, so people were knowing the basic facts of it, but they couldn't comprehend it. They just couldn't understand how this could be happening. And as you mentioned, one of my favorite stories illustrating this is that the Polish embassy in exile invites Felix Frankfurter, a Jewish man who's on the Supreme Court, to meet a survivor of one of the Polish camps. And the survivor tells the story and Frankfurter says, right out, I, don't, I can't believe you. And the Polish diplomat says, what are you talking about? He's just told you this story. What do you, he's not lying. He's, and Frankfurter says, I didn't say he's lying. I said, I can't believe it. And that's what many people felt until the, the photographs and movies came back. Which of course means a long time later. So even those who now criticize FDR, criticize the allies for not hitting the railway tracks, to the best of your knowledge, that the Nazi killing machine aimed at Jews was that large, that extensive, that systematic, was not fully understood until say, you write about this too, the future president Dwight D. Eisenhower, the main commander of the allied troops, after concentration camps were liberated, saw what the Nazis had done. Right. Uh, Eisenhower did a really amazing thing. He forced groups of senators and congressmen and journalists from the United States to come see the camps, to forced? make sure people would not forget the camps. And forced? They... Invi invited? Urged? You said forced. Forced. Oh. <laughs> well, I guess you're saying Eisenhower, uh, even before becoming president in 53, uh, was such a, a hero that if General Eisenhower said, you've got to come and see this, that's what it was like to a senator or a congressman. Yeah. Well, it was also news media organizations wanting to stay favorably uh, in touch with the soldiers winning the war. So, so there was a reason for this, but he was able to force people to come and see the death camps. And they published a number of articles called Lest We Forget. Lest We Forget. OK. And, and when we think about it in an honest way, and I, I don't know if you deal with this thought in your I don't think you deal with this thought in your book, Greg, um, whether just as the war was ending, People like General Eisenhower and indeed President Truman, who had taken over from Roosevelt after he died, of course, um, they, they had to justify what the United States had just done. What was this victory all about? And so before getting around to the business of rebuilding Europe through the Marshall Plan, 
um, and, and helping Germany, uh, divided Germany, West Germany, uh, become a democracy. Long before that, I think the first order of business was to justify to the American people what we just did. Paint all the GIs as heroes, of course, but would you agree there's a measure of justification, including, therefore, the mass murder, the Shoah, the Holocaust? Well, to me, the reason for winning the war was the Holocaust. But I think in 1945, the reason people were uh, uh, happy about winning was to spread American values across the world instead of fascist values. That it wasn't, uh, you know, Tojo had attacked us, uh, 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 Hitler and Mussolini were threats and getting rid of them was a major issue. To me, actually, the winning of World War II is about ending the Holocaust. Because one of the things that's astounding is that at the very end of the war, when they could afford to have more soldiers in Berlin, although, no, they were too busy killing Jews. They couldn't even defend the Fuhrer in Berlin because they were too busy with the Holocaust. It, it was that kind of psychosis that really comes home over and over again in researching this story. And as for Americans getting it, earlier we spoke about Hollywood for a while, reluctant to make anti-Nazi films. But once the US entered the war, popular culture, including Hollywood films and film shorts made for the War Department, seen in all the movie theaters across America. And how about one of my favorite topics, comic books, right? Captain America in a Marvel comic is punching Hitler in the face. So pop culture was helpful. The, there was a, I really enjoyed researching this part of the, the story. So uh, one of the great hit movies of the year was about Sergeant York, which is about a sharp sharpshooter who feels it violates his religious principles to take part in war until it's explained to him that sometimes the only way to overcome evil is to go to war and fight. And he reluctantly agrees. And the movie made of his story becomes this huge success. Of course, there's the great dictator with Charlie Chaplin who no one wanted to make during the isolationist period. And he put all of his money that he had into making it. It was the biggest success of his career. And obviously, so- Obviously spoofing Hitler because that's one weapon against a dangerous dictator. Make fun of him, right? Right. Uh, uh, Chaplin appears as both Hitler, a parody of Hitler, and as a, a, a Jewish shopkeeper whose uh, uh, house is full of kittens and who has anti-Jewish graffiti on his windows. So you're seeing it brought home to Americans in many ways. Mrs. Miniver about uh, people surviving the Blitz. Uh, the, the war sort of comes home and these become very popular. Churchill's speeches are a hit on the bestseller list. Uh, uh, so you see it extend out in every direction. Well, there's the obvious sacrifice during a war of our boys and some of our girls going off to fight, take part in the war effort, you know, based in, in, in England and then going into Europe. Then, of course, you have the Pacific Theater. In other words, we have so many men at war. That's America feeling a sacrifice. Many were dying, of course. Wounded were coming back. Um, but what other sacrifices were there? Uh, as you said, during the Depression, we felt poor. During this whole process of going to war, there was more money flowing and more jobs and more work. Women had to fill in often jobs that were traditionally done by men. Uh, what sacrifices were Americans called upon to make because we were at war? I don't feel that we did a lot of sacrificing besides the deaths in combat because American corporate profits doubled from 1940 to 1945. People who were making 40 cents an hour during the depression were now making $2 and 40 cents an hour. One story that didn't, I had to, I had to cut for uh, length was about a guy who signs up for two uh, uh, contracts of service. So he's away for three years. And so he leaves uh, uh, right around Pearl Harbor and he comes back home in 43. And when he leaves, his family of six is living in a two room shack. And when he comes back, his family says, you needed to tell us earlier you were coming home because we need to schedule our vacations to be able to see you. Everyone has their own house. They're all on vacation. You know, the, the revolution and the economic status of Americans is extraordinary. Uh, and it's really seen in the whole Rosie the Riveter saga, one of my favorite things of researching this book was handling a rivet gun, which is basically like a machine gun that throws bolts. So the idea of women, you see this mythological figure of a woman so strong she can handle this gun. But my favorite uh, wartime 
uh, Homeland story is about how Ronald Reagan is running domestic propaganda for Roosevelt. He was a big supporter of Roosevelt then. And he sends out a photographer to take pictures of beautiful women working on the assembly lines. The photographer ends up at a drone factory in California before doing this book. I didn't even know there were drones at World War II. And so uh, at that drone factory, he finds this woman and he thinks, this is amazing. She's incredible. He takes all these pictures of her. She uses them to get a modeling contract. And then she goes to 20th Century Fox and changes her name to Marilyn Monroe. So thank you, Arsenal Democracy, for giving us Marilyn Monroe, besides defeating Hitler. What, what, what a good point. And of course, Rosie the Riveter, not merely mythological, because lots of American women really were doing those jobs. And, and that made a huge change. As a matter of fact, let's let's remind our, 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 our viewers that the book v, v is for Victory, you've said is about an American revolution, right? Right. So uh, historians now think of two American revolutions, both, of course, the 1776 one, and now we think of 1861, the end of slavery as the second American revolution. I'm saying that between defeating the Great Depression and winning World War II, the Roosevelt does the third revolution. So you start with what the country is like in 33 and what it's like in 45, and it's an overturning, it's an upending of the entire nation to defeat these two great evils. And he's not only successful, but he creates this wholly new United States, which is the leader in world affairs with the United Nations and an enormous military. And pretty much what we think of America today is not at all what America was like in 33. Right, and you point out that even after being reelected, to a fourth term in 1944, Roosevelt, in fact, was quite ill and he died. And in 1945, he's gone and he never got to write his own memoir. So that means you as a as a historian and you love doing your own research, you didn't have the easiest thing, which would have been FDR's own book, like Churchill wrote volumes of his. Right. You, you really were kind of missing FDR's version of things, weren't you? Absolutely. And the big problem is that many people who work for FDR realize that this happy-go-lucky guy next door, guy you can have a beer with, a regular guy on the street, always happy, always happy to see you, likes everybody, was not the real man at all. And they kept trying to look inside and see who the real Roosevelt was, but they never found him. So it'd be, it's very difficult writing a biography of someone who told Orson Welles, you know, Orson, you and I are the greatest actors in the world. Wow, yeah, I understand the challenge. Now, you were researching this, of course, for five years and even longer with your other World War II books and, and other books you've written and articles. Um, and Craig, but when you were starting, is this relevant? What was going on in America, right? You've said that in the 1930s, Americans were at each other's throats. So about five years ago, it happened to be, oh, after the Obama term, terms are over and Trump is president, and there is a sense again that Americans are at each other's throats, very divided. Um, and then we get a war in Ukraine where we blame an autocrat, practically a dictator, Vladimir Putin of Russia, and the U.S. is, and so is Britain, right? Two countries, U.S. and Britain and France, they're responding big, spending tons of money, sending weapons for Ukraine to use and lots of help. So the floor is yours. Tell me about the parallels that you that you see, if you don't mind. So this book started off as being a very basic book on the arts of democracy because a military analyst casually said to me, you know, on the battlefield, logistics eat strategy for lunch. And I thought, what the hell are we military historians doing writing all these strategy books? So I started realizing that the new state of the art in World War II was about the Zarsa democracy, but then it expanded to really be about how a sort of impoverished country rises up to defeat this great evil. And along the way, there are constant analogies to what's going on now. So the America First Committee of that time is very much like Make America Great Again Now. The anti-immigrant policies that that time are very much like the anti-immigrant policies now. The Silicon Valley of our time was exactly reflected in Detroit, the state of the art in managing and technology where the automobile manufacturers, the, guy, the people who had revolutionized direct-to-consumer sales were Sears Roebuck, exactly like Amazon, and the Ford Motor had revolutionized how cars are made just like Apple. So it's constantly being referenced back and forth what's going on then and what's going on now, including the fact that the civilian population of the United States was maybe not 
100% committed to the war, but they were pretty committed to the war. And that's something we haven't seen since World War II. There's meaning, some... uh, meaning helping Ukraine defend itself, of course, and, and slapping Russia or teaching Putin a, a lesson, uh, again, in looking for a parallel. I mean, among other things that are different, is no one's talking about sending lots of US troops. And due to intervening history, the Vietnam syndrome, the feeling about the US heavy military involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq having gone badly, as most people look back on it, accomplished some things, of course. There is no taste, would you agree, for sending American troops to Ukraine. But if NATO were attacked, of course, under treaty, we'd have to. Um, uh, just, just, just help me with that. This is quite different when it's about um, using some of our, our money, our military knowledge, our military hardware to turn back someone. And, and Russia has been the U.S. enemy since shortly after World War II. I mean, the whole point of NATO was to hold back Russia. So now we have a chance to do it. Is that, is that how you see it? Well, actually, I see that if you look at the money we spend, uh, militarily about Russia, the Ukraine operation is the greatest bargain in American history because we're already spending all this and now it has a focus and now it has a reason. Uh, we already have uh, over 800 military bases overseas. So it's not like any Americans need to leave the United States to fight in the first place. So, so it's a much more complicated, interesting story. But to me, the story has to be that the United States uh, has to... Uh, be involved in fighting where the American people support it. And the military has left uh, the American people behind in pursuing wars in Iraq and Vietnam. Uh, yeah, and I'll just and cap think, that. Yeah, I'll just cap that, that uh, compared with the period you talk about where President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was able to, to whip up a, a consensus of, of popular support for what we had to do. Um, there's no consensus on anything in these United States these days. All right, that's that. That's just me. Craig, we will hear more from you because Suzanne Borden of Moment Magazine will now take the screen again because there have been questions typed in to the special Zoom box. Uh, Suzanne, what do you have? Great, thank you both for that, that fascinating conversation. Uh, the first question is, um, what can we learn from the past uh, to help us with today's dramatic increase in combating anti-Semitism? Um, well, in my opinion, what you do is you have uh, more Jews in a more public sphere, because I think anti-Semitism primarily comes from people who don't know any Jews. Uh, and so we need more Jews and more public Jews. We need more marvelous Mrs. Maisel, so we need more uh, Jewish uh, figures in uh, public media. Keeping in mind that Craig Nelson is not Jewish, but lives in New York City. So and I am chosen bad. adjacent. Chosen adjacent, many, many, many acquaintances, friends, and fellow New Yorkers, of course, of course. I have a rabbi. Way to go. <laughs> uh, 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 jumping off of that, uh, somebody somebody put in the uh, Q&A that there's a quote by Eisenhower at the National Holocaust Museum in which he predicts that a day will come when people will deny that the Holocaust happened, thus the importance of photos, um, which leads to a different question of, what are your thoughts about recent surveys that show so many people, particular young people, uh, don't know much about the Holocaust um, and, and have no idea the numbers of Jews that died in it? Well, we have a terrible history education problem in this country. Uh, when I wrote about going to the moon, if I talked to someone under the age of 40, about a third of them said, oh, you're going to talk about how that's all made up, you know? Uh, so it's... It, it, the lack of historic education is really depressing and we need a lot more of it. And especially we need a lot more of it on Netflix and Disney Plus and the streaming services. Because I think there is a way of telling these kinds of stories that, in fact, I first learned about the Holocaust on a ABC TV miniseries when I was a Texas goy at the age of 14, a great show called The Holocaust. I wish I could watch it again, but that's when I first heard about it on a TV show. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, what did FDR do to stop American companies from helping to enable the Nazi war objectives, including logistics to transport Jews to the death camps? 
Well, there wasn't really anything he could do because he had a hard time just convincing many American companies to sign on with the war effort. In fact, Henry Ford, the famous anti-Semite, even though Ford had factories in Britain helping the British and in uh, Amsterdam and, and Germany helping the Germans, he didn't want to help the Americans. And finally, uh, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt went on the radio and said, you know, if there's a national emergency, the president could take over the Ford Motor Company. And that's what turned him around to help it. So there was an awful lot of, of effort just to get the arsenal democracy going here. And there was really almost nothing he could do about what was going on in, in Germany. Thank you. Uh, did FDR know what Breckenridge Long was doing or not doing? Uh, was Hull an anti-Semite? And uh, the fact that Wells and Long were classmates of FDR, um, did FDR have much to do with them when they were in office? No, FDR didn't know until he received the memo that uh, uh, Dan mentioned from the Treasury Department, how severe the situation was, and neither did Hull. Both of them did no idea what Long was up to in denying visas to Jews. He did it all on his own. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did the Roosevelt administration consider placing European Jews in Africa and other remote locations after the war rather than allowing them to enter the U.S.? Well, I believe uh, that's sort of beyond my research, but I do have to say there's extensive stories of what happened to people in the DP camps who did not, go, for some reason or another, go to Israel. And that's a whole story. Unfortunately, I'm not that knowledgeable about it. It's a very interesting story. And by the way, Craig, uh, just to give NBC credit, it, it was NBC that did Holocaust. I just looked it up. 1978. <laughs> and it was sure. brilliantly done and humanized the victims. And uh I guess I share your feeling that more of that, please, on, in popular culture. Great, thank you. Uh, someone said that they want, they've heard several times that there was a Jewish man who told the president that uh, everything was exaggerated in Germany. And uh, that's part of the reason that, um, that they did not go to war sooner. Is there any truth to that? I don't know of any Jewish man who said that, but that was very common with the State Department. In fact, at the, ver the very first information about the uh, death camps was sent from a Polish uh, Jewish man to uh, Stephen Weiss, who was a prominent Jewish activist in New York. And the State Department basically kept those messages from getting to Weiss because they thought they were fabricated and inflammatory. And they kept those messages away from him for almost a year. So the State Department has a lot to answer for in all this story. Thank you. Uh, someone would like to know about your research project, pro process. How did you go about that? And uh, is there one thing or two things that were most surprising to you? Uh, well, I just, it's basically what used to be called shoe leather in journalism. I, I guess it can't be called shoe leather since no one goes anywhere anymore. But it used to be called shoe leather where you would just, you know, you sit in the car for eight hours if you're a detective waiting for the suspect to come out of the bar. You you, you go everywhere you can to, to learn about these things and you read bil billions and billions of pages. So my favorite story, my favorite insight actually comes from, there were three different a secret service agent who wrote memoirs of the Roosevelt administration. And the third one that no one reads has the greatest thing I've ever heard, which is that Eleanor Roosevelt did not require any type of police or secret service uh, protection because she always had a gun in her purse and she knew how to use it. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> then she's safe. Thank, thanks, right. Suzanne. I have a couple more for, for you, Craig Nelson, if you don't mind. And, and it's, but it's still on the, uh, it's still on that issue of how to try to get at the truth, right? If you're if you're writing history and there aren't many living witnesses still available, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. When you wrote Rocket Men about, uh, well, you might say the race to the moon. Uh, and by the way, did that become a TV series? I know there's some streaming. I don't know if it's based on your book. Did it? Well, there's a terrible story about that. So there's a biography of Neil Armstrong that became a movie called First Man. Oh. Only none of the drama of the space race was in that book. So they took all the drama out of my book for free and it's nonfiction. So what can I do? But there we I'm go. glad to have given you a platform to say that. Now, the, different, <laughs> now the, the difference in research, if you will, that you can but need to 
approach living people. I, I'm thinking about the responsibility of the, the urge, the desire to try to get things right. If there are still living witnesses and participants, then you got to work, that you, you got to be Mr. Charming, right? To get them to participate and, and cooperate with you as opposed to memoirs and newspaper articles, true? Right. So historians, we have a law. The English do not have this law, but we, Americans have a law that you can't say anything unless you have it on a piece of paper. So you can't say, I believe that. You, you can say, I believe that, but you can't really express a fact unless you have it on a piece of paper. You have to have it in a letter or, or a memoir or something like that. And you're hoping to find conflicting pieces of paper and analyze a story that way. Uh, and just like uh, with journalism, you try and find more than one person to say something. You know, it's very difficult for us historians because almost everyone's dead and many of the people who are still alive are non compass mentis. So there's a, a race against time to do these books. Uh, but what, what have you found? Well, I mean, let's say when you were doing uh, Rocket Men and you were approaching living people, yeah, how, do you, how do you approach them when, when you're the kind of person who's writing not an article, not a quick TV or radio interview, but you're in effect telling them you're about to have your place in history if you tell me, Craig Nelson, your story? Well, what I usually do is I try and uh, get at the leads. And when I approached the three astronauts, uh, uh, Buzz Aldrin's response was to write his own book in competition with mine. Uh, Neil Armstrong's was to say, uh, there's, there's nothing more that needs to be said about Apollo 11. Everything that needs to be written has already been written. But he was mad at me because I tracked him down by looking up his wife's real estate tax uh, filings. So he was irritated at that. But uh, Michael Collins did write back and answer obscure things. But primarily, the big names have a patter down. They have an anecdote that they tell you and they will tell you word for word the same anecdote they said to the last guy who came through and the solution to that is to talk to janitors and the women who sewed the ram chips and the people like that my favorite moment in researching that book was i went to nasa to watch a liftoff take place from the same launch pad that apollo 11 used and the a woman running the thing a, a military pr woman whose job was to keep me from knowing things uh, showed me a map of the places i could sit and they were all three and a half miles away and i said can I sit closer? And she said, well, sir, if an accident happens on the pad and the rocket explodes, it will do so with four-fifths the power of an atomic bomb, sending 100-pound pieces of shrapnel for a radius of 3.2 miles. So NASA prefers that it gets it 3.5 miles away. How interesting that they love numbers, but yeah, those kind of people do. <laughs> now, in, in researching this book, your latest on its way, I hope to being a bestseller, V is for Victory, Franklin Roosevelt's American Revolution and the Triumph of World War II. In researching V for Victory, um, you also, you already mentioned that one of your favorite research moments was holding a riveting gun. So you'd get a better understanding of that iconic poster and, and, and postage stamp. Uh, anything else come to mind that you, again, you were researching this, how, how FDR managed to achieve a, a revolution and wake up America from its poor depression. Um, I mean, see, so you knew what you were going after, as you said, arsenal of democracy and logistics and trucks and planes. Uh, maybe there was a moment that turned you around to, to say, oh, it's all about a hero, Roosevelt. Well, actually, it was more the detail. I sort of felt this way to begin with because I'd already done two World War II books, but it was sort of the little details that came alive that really brought it up. So one of them is the fact that when Martha Gellhorn and Ernest Hemingway were invited to dine at the White House, they have to pass through the Newark airport to get there, and Gellhorn immediately orders three sandwiches and is scarfing them all down. And Hemingway says, what the hell are you doing? We're going to dinner at the White House. And Gellhorn says, it's the worst food you've ever had in your life. You're not going to be able to eat a bite of it. And Hemingway, he starts scarfing down sandwiches too. So they arrive there and it's absolutely true. It is the worst food anyone has ever eaten. And uh, Eleanor will do nothing about it to fix this. Uh, but the other story is that uh, the FBI surveillance files on Eleanor Roosevelt is something like the biggest FBI files in the world. And I didn't accept the explanation that she was left and he was right. So we had all these agents following her all the time. I thought there must be something else to it. So I went into their correspondence and I found out that while Eleanor was relentlessly on top of J. Edgar Hoover for things she didn't like the FBI was doing, every time he asked her to speak at the FBI, she said no. So I, she then followed her because he was mad about her turning down his invitations. 
It's a J. Edgar Hoover story. I'm sure you've got lots more about all of this. Uh, I'm thrilled to have spoken with you, Craig Nelson. Best of luck with the book. And we go back to Suzanne. Thank you. I, I will say I did enjoy the part of the book where you were very specific about some of the dishes that they were <laughs> serving. And um, I don't know how anybody stomached them. Um, lastly, uh, what is next for you? What are you planning on writing about? What do you, what do you hope uh, to do to share history with us in the future? I still have two more months of promotion. I go to Washington for the Arlington Library and the Pentagon, and then I go to FDR Library, and then I do a New York Historic Society show here in the park. And so I'm just doing that, and I have no idea what's happening next. I hope I survive. <laughs> well, 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 we'll look to uh, the future to see what else you um, are inspired to write about. Uh, again, Craig Nelson, I want to thank you. Thank you, Dan Revive. The book is V is for Victory. I encourage everybody to take a read. I put the link in the chat so everybody can find that. I'll be sending out a follow-up email in a few days that will include a link to this recording, and I'll also uh, include again the link to the book. Please go to Moment's website at momentmag.com to sign up for next week's program about, about BEP and Anne Frank. And again, thank you all for joining us and we'll see everybody next time. Thank you. It was an honor. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.